I'll make an announcement in the beginning of the service today that our monthly meeting, Monday night meeting that would normally be held tomorrow night, the first Monday night, will be held a week from tomorrow. The classes are off tomorrow, so we will have the meeting will be a week from tomorrow instead of tomorrow night. You're all welcome to be here this morning. I believe we'll start the service this morning. We'll read a psalm this morning. This is the 115th psalm. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy true sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? And that's for all of us this morning to be asking that question. Where is now our God? Who is our God? Is it the things of this world or is it the things above? Where are our treasures today? Are they on the things of the world or, or do we have our treasures on things above? But where and to should the heathen then say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And that's the question. It goes right back to what we were just talking about. Let us all this morning be asking ourselves, who is our God? Is our God the one that is in heaven there today mediating for us? And, and God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord able to do all that we can ask for here spiritually to give us peace here in this life. But he says that the people of the world, the heathen, he says their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And what is our idol? I want it to be the works of God's hands, to be looking to Him for our peace and our hope. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have they, but they see not. And he's speaking about the spiritual part today. And we all have a mouth, but are we able to speak the spiritual truths of God? And we have natural eyes, but are we able to see the spiritual part? Are we, do, are, can we have those eyes focused and singled on that spiritual part today? They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. And what he's talking about there is that all the spiritual things, the spiritual part of our life. He says we, these people, they all have that same opportunity. But he says that they do not know. They, do, they are not able to see. They're not able to hear. They're not able to speak the spiritual things. And he says them that make them are the same. And what is the condition with you and me today? That's the question that our Lord keeps calling our attention to. It's for us to let's be in that condition to where we have those eyes to see. And we have the ears to hear. And that can only come through the connection with Jesus Christ our Lord. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. 
He is their help and their shield. Trust in Him. And old Israel, and he's talking about the ones that God loves. And that is all of mankind. Is When I look at that as God calling the people in this day and time anyway, about uh, calling them the Israel, is that is all of His people that is upon the earth today. Wherever they might be, whoever they might be. And that is the ones who are a part of the true spiritual church church of Christ. And again, that is those who is a part, who has been able to receive of that Spirit of the Holy Ghost that He has offered to all. And He says, I'm going back to my Father. And He says, now you, He commanded His servants here to preach and to teach the things that I have commanded to you. Preach and to teach the spiritual truths of God. And then for us to be able to accept them and be able to receive of that Spirit is the most wonderful thing that could happen to us all. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And we've talked about that, if you remember, maybe a few Sundays ago about that shield of faith, I believe it is. And what that shield of faith does, it is there so that you can have the armor against all of the fiery darts that Satan has to come against you. And remember what we talked about there is what, what is that shield used for? May not be today, but in the day of, of when this writer was writing these things, the warriors, when they went into war, they needed something to protect them. It was basically hand-to-hand -hand combat, so they were using spears or swords or whatever it might be, arrows. And they used that shield to hold in front of them. It was made out of some metal or something so that the sword would not be able to penetrate them. And they could be in hold that to protect that body. And that's what he's talking about here is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ so that then we can put on that shield. We can have that spirit, have the spirit of God that is then that shield in front of that, that spirit of the Holy Ghost that is resting in front of our soul that can be in front of all of us. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. And then he says, Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Now I want us to all to understand what he's saying there. He spoke of the things there that he would bless. And he then he goes in that 13th verse and he says, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Whoever they are, it does not matter. But remember what, that, what we have to do to get to be able to do that, to be able to receive that blessing, then we've got to trust in the Lord. Go back up there and he says, ye that fear him and trust the Lord. He is their help and their shield. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. If we have that godly fear, that's not a fear of Him like we'd have a fear of someone that was going to hurt us or something like that. But we have a fear that if we do not put ourselves into His hands, then the wrath of God will be rained out upon us. We have a great respect for Him and a great love for Him so that we'll want to do all that He asks for us to do, whoever it might be, small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. And I know today that we are blessed tremendously 
from the Lord. Just look at all the things that He has given to us naturally, but most of all, look at what He is offering and giving to us, that spiritual part. That part that His Son, God the Father, sent His Son here to the earth. And He overcame Satan. If we go back and we read there, I believe you can read in Luke to where that right after Christ was baptized, He went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And He did eat nothing. And when He came out there, He was afterward hungered, the Bible says. But while He was there in that 40 days there, the angels, I believe, was there and they were ministering to him and he was communicating with his father. And his father was able to sustain this body to where it did not need the food and the water as you and I would have to have it today. But he was there communicating with his father. And his father was teaching him, I believe, the things that he would need to go on in the work that was right before him to establish the law of grace. And he was able then, when he came out, to be filled with that Spirit of God, filled with the power of God. And God allowed Satan to have access to him. Just as God will allow Satan to have access to you and me. But we can also have that power. We can have that Spirit. We can be filled with that so that we can overcome Satan. Satan immediately came to him. And he was there. And he tempted the Lord, telling him all kind of things. Telling him that if he would fall down and worship him, he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. And these were the kingdoms that God had created. Satan had no power over the Son. The Son was able to just, he was blessed by the Father. He was full of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. He was able to resist him, even though Satan was coming at him at a very, maybe a weak point in his natural life, when his body was hungering for the food. And Satan telling him to just to take these stones and to make them bread. But he says, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of, the, out of the word of God, I believe, or something to that effect is what he was saying. That we had to put our faith and trust in the Father. And the Father would give us all that we needed. He didn't, he didn't need it any time to let Satan be the one that was telling him what to do and him following the instructions of Satan. And we don't need to be any to any day now doing those things at all. You are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and from evermore. Pray and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And I want us all, each and every one of us this morning, to be just as the writer was there. To praise Him for what He has done. How He sent His Son here upon the earth. And what He did so that we can sit here today. And that we can all that want it have peace. That spiritual peace. That most wonderful peace. I believe that as Christ said it at a meal with, with a man that had offered for him or he to, for Christ to come and to eat with him. And as Christ was sitting there, there was a sinner, a woman who had great, great sins, but she came in and she anointed his feet with oil, with anointment, and began to wipe them with her hair and wash them with the tears that fell from her eyes, knowing what Jesus Christ could do for her, that He could forgive her her sins, and He had. 
even though she had committed some great sinful crimes. But he was willing to forgive. And he tells us the same, that we must forgive if we want to be forgiven for our sins. And we have to forgive and we will forgive if we walk close to him. Because there is nobody here, not one, none, that has not committed sins worthy of eternal damnation. Not a one of us here. But we all have the opportunity to take our condition to Him. Just as that woman was able to there. And I believe that the man that, he, that the Lord had gone into the house to eat with and to be with, he had a problem with what was going on. And I don't believe he even said anything about it. But the Lord understood what was his thinking. Just as he understands our thinking today. And he told the man, he says, I have come into your house. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me a kiss. But this woman, since the time I have come in, has done these things to me. And he looked upon the woman. And these are the words that I want us all to hear and I want us all to understand about today. He looked upon her and he says, Go in peace. Thy faith has saved thee. And I want us to all to examine ourselves and see today if, if we know about that peace. If we know about that peace of what Jesus was talking about. And have we been saved by Him? There's another plan I believe I'm reminded of there where I believe it was Paul. He went into a group of people and he said they were believers. They believed on repentance for our sins. And he was there preaching to them and talking to them. And he asked them, he said, have you received the Spirit of the Holy Ghost? And that's what I'd want to ask each and every one of us here today. Have you been able to receive the Spirit of the Holy Ghost? Even though you might be a believer and believe on Jesus Christ, have you been able to receive that Spirit? And that's what he asked these people. And they said, we do not even know whether there be a spirit of the Holy Ghost or not, even though they were believers. And he said, I believe he asked them, to what were you baptized? And I believe they told him John to Baptist. But he then went into the discourse of telling them about the spirit of the Holy Ghost and telling them to be baptized in that name. And they were baptized and they were able to receive of that Spirit of the Holy Ghost and rejoice in the Word and have that peace that we just talked about, that spiritual peace. There is nothing more that we could have that is greater than being able to receive of that from our Lord and our Savior to be able to receive help from Him. And He is there today at the right hand of God the Father mediating for you and for me to all of those that ask, all of those that want, that more than anything here upon the earth, those that are willing to not be as those people there, that he says, where should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And that is where our God, I want it to be there in heaven, not something that is made by hands. That's what Paul went around preaching about, that there was no God that was made by hands. There is no God here upon this earth. It will all be done away. But we have one that we can worship and we can be a part of. And that's being a part 
of the, of the true church, and that's that spiritual church, a part of the spiritual church of Christ by making that connection with Him and by receiving that Spirit. And that is offered to all of mankind all over the world, whoever it might be. They can hear the Word. But they don't only hear it. But once we hear it, doesn't matter who you are or I am, we have to then hear the Word and then take our condition to the Lord. Ask Him to forgive us our sins. Ask Him to be our Savior. And then ask Him to give us that Spirit of the Holy Ghost that we might be able to do a work that's acceptable to Him. Just joining a church somewhere will not save you, save you or me, either one. But that's the first start. But then taking it to Him and being able to receive, going all the way to where we can receive that Spirit, then we can be saved. And we can be able to stand and stand before Him at that final day with confidence. And to be able to stand here upon the earth today with confidence that we have that connection. And be bold in His work when it's necessary to be bold. To stand up against Satan. Never compromising with Satan. Never taking that spirit into a condition to where the Lord would not be pleased with it. So let's this morning do as he said there in that last verse. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth. Let's start now if that has not been in your mind and has not been in it up to this time. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore Praise the Lord. Amen to that. There's so much that we can be thankful for this morning. So let's all give our undivided attention to the Lord. And let's let Him instruct us and encourage us. That's what He's wanting to do. He's not here to try to beat us down. He says, I did not come here to condemn you. Remember, we were all condemned. We are each and every one of us condemned to eternal damnation. But He says, I came to save the world. He came so that we all might have that opportunity to know Him. And to know His Father through Him. So that we can then be saved eternally. We've turned here. I believe we'll turn here to Romans. This is the fourth chapter of Romans. I want to read a few verses here in that third chapter of Romans. We'll start at the 26th verse of the third chapter. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. And he's talking about how can you and I be saved today. The Jews there had a law that they had to work under. And that was a law that they had to do certain works to be able to be saved. But Jesus Christ came here to the earth and He has said, All that believe upon Me believe that I am the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
shall be saved. And that's what he's talking about here. And he says, where is boasting then? If that is the case, if we are to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ, he says, where is the boasting? Who are you to boast about anything spiritually? And who am I that I can boast about how good I am or who, what I can do? He says, it is excluded. There is not any of that. Should not be any of that in righteousness. By what law? Of works? No, he says. It is not by the law of works anymore. It's by the law of faith in Jesus Christ. And by having that, then we'll go on and let's see what he says. And he says, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now he's saying there that we, we are, is, are these things the truth? He says, do we conclude that a man is justified by faith, by having the right and the proper faith in God instead of the deeds of the law, of having to keep the things, all the ceremonies and all these things there. Now there are certain parts of that law that has not been done away with. You can take the Ten Commandments so to speak. Those are things there that was written in that law that we still must abide by today. But instead of just the Sabbath day keeping it holy, we must keep every day holy. And we, it's not just a day, but they had certain things that they could only do on that Sabbath day. Those things were taken away. But we can have faith in Jesus Christ that He's the Son of God. We can have faith that He can save us. We can have faith that He can give us that Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Not by the deeds that we do by keeping the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes. And that's what he says. Of the Gentiles also. Now Paul wanted to make that very plain and clear to the people in those days. I want to make it very plain and clear today that he, he is not just the God of a certain little group of people. He is the God of all this earth. He is the God of all mankind if they will come to Him. Now He will be the God of, as I said, the God of all mankind. And the wrath of Him will be rained out on all of those do not, that do not submit to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. He is still the God of all mankind. And He is offering salvation to all of mankind, wherever they are. He is, is He the God of the Jews only? Is He not of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Does not matter about this fleshly part. Those in, under the law, they had to be circumcised. But he says there is no difference in circumcising and in uncircumcising. But it is having the faith of God, faith of Jesus Christ, and working with them. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. We establish the law, and that's what we have done. We've established that this is the law of grace now. It's what we are establishing, that Christ established it here upon the earth. We are continuing to work in it and continuing to let others be able to see that work within us. If you have that spirit there, and that is what we are doing, nothing more but establishing the law of grace here upon the earth. And they did nothing more but establish the law of Moses by just it, the things being fulfilled and then us moving on into the law of grace. And it is not by your works. The only thing that you and I can do to be saved is by going to Jesus Christ. And we all, each and every one of us, must do that for our own individual self. There is, the Christ will never push Himself upon us. God will not push Himself upon you. You have to want to be able to receive that. 
more than anything else upon the earth. And he will give it to you. But we've got to see how undone we are. We have to see that without our Lord and Savior, we are eternally lost. But we can have hope and peace here with him. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father as pertaineth to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now let's think about what took place there, that Abraham did believe in God. And he had, he let, he had faith in God, that God would be able to do whatever was necessary for him. And he was able then to just... By having faith in him, he was able to go and to keep the commandment what God had told him to do. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. And that is, he has given that to all of us. Without our works, there is nothing that we can do that is good enough to have eternal life. But we can receive that from him, and he will give it to us. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. And that is for us today. That is our condition. It is blessed unto us. Whose iniquities are forgiven. Whose sins are forgiven. Whose wrongdoings are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Covered with what? Covered with the Spirit of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And the Lord will never impute that. And if we go to Him, He'll give us that shield of faith that then we can have that protection of our soul. Cometh this blessedness, blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in when he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. These were things that was given way back, and Paul was just trying to get across to these people. That this is a new time, a new law. That Christ has come here and He has established these things. And I want us to all to understand these things today. That that opportunity is for everybody. And that's what Paul was wanting them to understand there in that day. There was people, I believe, that were still trying to hold on to the old law. There was people that were still trying to hold on and to say that you must be circumcised to be able to receive help from God. All of these things there. But Paul was just bringing these things to their attention to even show them that even Abraham and these things by the things that he did that God showed for him to do, even though he was in uncircumcision at that time, he was able to have righteousness imputed into him. And we are able to receive it today. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. 
And that is the thing that I want us to all to understand. That righteousness can be imputed unto all of mankind here upon the earth that want it. Now do, is that something that is that is going that people are going out and in a wholesale manner trying to be able to receive of that? I don't see it that way. I don't see that at all. And God even or the Lord even said while he was here he said many would seek to enter in. But he said few would be able to enter in. Why? Because they are trying to go up in their own terms, their own way, instead of serving Jesus Christ and God the Father and letting them be the one that directs us in all that we say and do. <clears throat> and the Father of circumcision... To them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet been uncircumcised. Now are we going to be able, or can we walk in that same faith? And that's what he's saying, that we've got to be able to walk in the same faith that Abraham had. And remember what that was, hey, the story there, that Abraham had a son. Isaac. And he there took him. He was his only son there. He was a son of an old age. And he had been promised by God that he would give it to him and that he would, his seed, of his seed would be in a multitude of people. But God came to Abraham and he gave him, he told him, gave him a commandment, gave him a work to do. He says, now you take Isaac and go into such and such place and you offer him up there for a burnt offering. Take his life, put him upon the altar and burn him up. Now look at what the faith of this man was. He knew that God had promised to give him this man, this son. He knew that God had told him that of his seed there would be a great multitude. But he also knew that God was the one that was giving him the commandment, telling him the things to do. He could communicate with God. He was walking that close with him. And he had great faith. And I believe very quickly he made the arrangements to go and to do what he did. He got his son, they took the wood, and they went. And as he got there, the son asked him, he says, Father, you have the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham told him, he said, the Lord will provide he had faith again. Faith that God would direct him. He knew that he had been directed by God to do this. And if we know that God is speaking to us and he is telling us something to do, we must follow those things. But be careful that you be not deceived. There are many people, there are many deceitful beings out today. And there are many that is being deceived into doing things, proclaiming to do it in the name of God. It goes directly against His work and is, has nothing to do with a godly work. But Abraham went on and he built the altar and he placed the wood and he placed Isaac upon that. And he drew the, the knife back to take his life. And an angel or God called his name and he looked around and there's the sacrifice. A ram with his horns stuck in the briars there and he could not get away. The Lord had provided. But the Lord had seen that this man Abraham would follow what he asked for him to do. He had full faith that God would, could raise this boy up 
He had promised th these things to do. And God could raise him right out of the ashes. And I know today that God can do some miracles for us if we'll walk close to him. And I know that the main miracle, the only, the, or the, not the only miracle, but the most important miracle that can happen in any one of our lives, I know that He can accomplish. And that is by giving you the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. That is the most wonderful miracle that can happen to any of us. <laughs> Healing this body if it's in a in, if it's sick, taking away all manner of pains or whatever it might be, giving us great riches here upon this earth is not a miracle that can even be compared with that miracle of the of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost that can give us all eternal life. Give us life to be able to live with our Lord and Savior and God the Father and all of the righteous forever and ever in that new Jerusalem where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more want, no more tempting of Satan. But be there with the righteous in a wonderful and in a glorified state. What a day that will be for us all. What a day. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them. And the father of circumcision to them, who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet been uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And think about that. That promise that through his seed, that came by faith. That Abraham had faith that God would be able to give him that son. He had faith that he would be able to raise him from the ashes if it was necessary. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where the law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. It is by faith in Jesus Christ and by the grace of God... To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. To the end. Now what is the promise? To the end, that is when our life is over. When this world is over. And now, what is the promise? The promise might be sure to all the seed. That promise of eternal life. That promise of power over Satan to all the seed, to all the righteous, to all those that have committed to Him. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Have we got that faith that Abraham had? Do you have that within you today? Do you believe that you can do the things that He asked for you to do and be filled with that faith? And to walk in it. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him who hath believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken of, so shall thy seed be. And he had hope that God would send him that son, and he had hope that he would be the father of many nations. 
But he had to have that faith for all that to come about. And being not weak in faith, and he was not weak in faith at all, he considered not his own body now dead, and when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, because he was promised these things by the angels. And he considered that, that these things would happen, even though he was almost a hundred years old and his wife was that age also, that they would be able to bear a child. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Now, are we going to stagger at the promise of God through unbelief? Are we going to stagger at the, the promise of God that He can give to all of us the Spirit of the Holy Ghost? Are we going to stagger at that? Are we going to wafer, waffle about those things and not take it seriously? What are we going to do in our day? For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where the law no law is, there is no transgression. Now let's listen carefully to these things. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not only which is of the law, but to that also which which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to them which was spoken, so shall thy seed be called, be. And being not weak in faith, not weak in faith at all, but considered not his own body now dead, which was delivered which was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now, all of those things that we read about there was because that he had full faith in God and that he knew that the promises of God, the things that God had to promise, he says he was fully able to perform it. Now when we go back and we read through the, the New Testament and we see all the promises that God has given to us by his people and we through the, through the, the Lord Jesus Christ Christ, and also through his people that were here, his disciples, and whoever it might be, there is promises that is made for us. But the most wonderful one at all that we keep talking about is receiving of that Spirit of the Holy Ghost. And with that comes the power of God, that then that we are able to perform the works the things that he would ask for us to do. Just as Abraham was full of faith, the only way that he could perform those work, do the things that God was asking him to do was by having been full of faith. And then he was able to do the works th that God asked him to do. And that's what you and I will be able to do today. By the faith in him, by having the faith of the grace and power of Jesus Christ, we'll also be able to then to lay aside the wicked works and do a work acceptable to him. Now it is not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, and that will be for us also, as he said, 
If we believe upon Him, if we believe upon God who raised Jesus from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And remember that, that He was delivered. Jesus Christ was delivered into the hands of sinful men for our offenses. As we talked about in the beginning, for our sins. And was raised again for our justification. He was raised, brought back to life so that we can be justified. That our life here upon the earth can be justified. And we can have eternal life then. And we can have that peace. And we can have hope here upon the earth now. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the thing that I believe I asked in the, morning, uh, in the beginning here about have we all received that Spirit of the Holy Ghost. We may be a believer, but have we received that key part? And he's talking about here, therefore being justified by faith, we have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've had that peace. We've been able to receive that. Paul had and others. By whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He says we have access to Jesus Christ. And I know that we do. Each and every one of us can have access to Jesus Christ. And if we have access to Him, we've got access to His Father. Think about that. You know, we see people all along, someone will say they may be in trouble. And they might go to someone, a friend, because they feel like that he might have access to someone in high authority. Some political figure or something that might be able to help them. And we'll go to those people and we will ask them all manner of things so that we might be able to get some help naturally. And we'll look upon people and we'll say they're really connected there with those with the high ups in the, in the state or in the federal government or whatever. And they may be able to get things done. But Paul is telling each and every one of us today that we have access to God the Father and the power of God through Jesus Christ. What more could we ask for than to be able to have that today? That can give us all the protection that we need spiritually or naturally, whatever it might be, to overcome Satan. By whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand, wherein we are a part of, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. He says, I glory in whatever that God brings upon me. And you go back and you read all about the history of Paul and what took place with him and how that he went through so much, so many tribulations, but he says, I count them as nothing that I might win Christ. And he says here that these tribulations that we go through, and if we'll go through them right and letting the Spirit of God direct us and not try to get ahead of God, listen to what He says works. And He says that worketh patience in us. It teaches us to be patient and to wait upon the Lord. And then He says, and patience experience and experience hope. 
If we wait upon the Lord, then we become patient. And as we become patient on these things, we experience these things and we, we see that God then can take care of it. And we, will, we have those experiences within us so we can have our faith increase. And also that experience then, we see what God can do. It brings hope in us. It shows us that God can bring us through these things. And we have hope. And we know that He will carry us on through all the trials and temptations and tribulations. And hope maketh not a shame. Why would we be ashamed of having the hope of God? Having the hope that God will lead us through these things. Having that connection. People are not ashamed when you say, well, so-and-so over there, he's got a connection with the governor. Or he's got a connection with some, some uh, senator or something to that effect. People look around and they're kind of proud of that kind of stuff. Why in the world would we want to be ashamed of having the hope of Christ within us? Us. And hope maketh not a shame. Why would we want to be ashamed of having that? It would not make us that spirit of God. Won't make us ashamed of having that. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now there is right back what we've talked about from the very beginning of the service today. And hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God, that having that love, that pure love for God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And He says that that love that they have, that they have extended to us is shed abroad in our hearts. We see the love. We feel that love. Because we see that we have been forgiven. Just as that woman had such a great love for Christ, she was willing to kiss His feet. She was willing to anoint it with that expensive ointment that she had instead of using it for herself. She was willing to wipe His feet with the hairs of her eyes, or the hair of her head, and let the tears of her eyes wash His feet. Because she had such great love. Because Jesus Christ had forgiven her for her sins. And that's why Paul could say here, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Look at what God had done for him. He had been a wretched man. A man that was trying to put the work of God off the earth. Having people put in prison and put to death. But God turned him around when, he, when his mind became to the point where that he was asking, What must I do, Lord? Am I following you? God was able to show him through Jesus Christ what to do. And he says here, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And he received that Holy Ghost down there in Damascus. And he was immediately then preaching Jesus Christ and Him our Lord and Savior. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And Christ did. He says, I didn't come to save for the righteous, for those that are saved. But he says, I came here for the ungodly, for the sinners. Is why he came here to the earth. And that's each and every one of us. I don't care who you are, you were born in sin. And you will stay in sin unless you ask the Lord to clean you up and to take get you out of that sin. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now I want us to think about these things. Now people this day and time do not believe, a lot of them, that the wrath of God will be rained out upon the wicked. But here Paul was just telling these people, and that's what I 
want us all to understand today that the wrath of God will be rained out upon the unrighteous. All of those that have not been able to receive that love by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Doesn't matter what your name is, how well connected you are, or what. You will, the wrath of God will be rained out upon you. But let's look at what Paul said. That to the righteous, he says, much more than being now justified by his blood. Christ died for us. He poured out his blood for 